Welcome to Sista's Place Inspiration and Entertainment Show interviews with authors, celebs, and much more with hostesses Latrice Carter and Selena Haskins. Welcome to Sister's Place podcast. Today on my podcast, I have an author spotlight interview with Beryl McClary. Welcome to the show, Beryl. Hi, thank you so much, Latrice. I'm so glad to be here today. Absolutely. I'm, it's a pleasure to have you. So tell my audience who Beryl McClary is. Oh, I would love to. Well, actually, I go professionally by Beryl Thompson McClary. And I am the wife of the founder of the Commodores, Thomas McClary. He's been married almost 28 years. I'm a mother of seven, actually raised six. Mm -hmm. I got married at 35 and had five children in six and a half years. I had my twins at 42. (laughs) (laughs) Thought you would like that. I have been a trial attorney since 1982. Um, I'm a woman of faith. And um, I'm a, now an author and a writer. And I'm just really excited about what life is to happen. But that's who I am. I'm a Beryl McClary, a, a woman of many hats. Hey, I love it. I love it. So what was it that inspired you to write the next chapter? Well, actually, as I was becoming turning 60, I started to look around. My husband and I travel, and by this time, the children are leaving. Um, mm-hmm. Everyone going to the various colleges, and the twins were in, um, I think they were in 12th grade. And I started looking at some of the others near my age, and I'm like, why are they looking like this? Why are they, some of my comrades, why have they stopped caring about the way they look? Mm-hmm. Uh, I just listened to their conversations. It seemed as if there was no longer a dream. It was perfunctory. Mm-hmm. Um, the conversations were going in a circle, sounding like, quote, unquote, old people. Mm-hmm. Now, why do I say that? Maybe because I had children so late. I had my twins at 42, my first child at 36. I was forced to stay young. Mm-hmm. Um, from the way I dress to the things I say, because I always had kids and kids around. Mm-hmm. And I knew there was more. I'm like, this is a different society. It wasn't like the agrarian society where our ancestors, our parents, and et cetera, may not have had the health care that they have today. Mm-hmm. Why is there a loss of vision? A concession to quote unquote age. And I started to look at that and I um, would hear people talk about my husband and I. Um, And he had written his book, Luck and Soul. It tracks his being the first to integrate uh, the high school in the 60s and his first at um, creating and starting the Commodore Band there at Tuskegee and finding Lionel Richie and his walk. And also as we track his going through his family and his transition, um, litigation and where we are today. And we often would hear, wow, you didn't give up because my husband started, we started in this litigation when he was 65. Mm -hmm. And I encouraged him to, because you still have dreams. You shouldn't stop dreaming. Without dreams, without goals, you die. Mm -hmm. And I, like so many others, all during my life, I care for people as a daughter, as a wife, Um, As an attorney, even though I've loved all aspects of my life and performances, I would give so much to others and I started to look back and say, what next? So even though I might have been exhausted, I stood back and this was a pivoting point in our marriage. And let me go, let me give you a, a caveat. I've always been a woman of adventure. Mm-hmm. I didn't get married until I was 35. I had no children. I used to be a missionary at part time. I would go to where there were terrorists. Oh, in the 80s, the shining path, where they would have you come off the, off the buses if you were Americans. And I would watch uh, and have the natives tell me, don't talk, don't talk. 
a <laughs> different language. So they wouldn't pull me off and harass or even take you away it as a captive because I was brown. They didn't bother brown people in the 80s, but they would take the white um, um, nuns off and uh, harass them, if not take them as they've been known, the shining path and kill Christians. And I would go into the mountains and I would preach the gospel and I would practice law. And I was always, I was a young girl and I was always looking for the opportunity to help someone. And I was always adventurous, bring it on. And even when hard times would come, because my mom died when I was 28, my dad died when I was 22. Yes. And I had taken care of them. My dad died of cancer. And I remember when they called me at a law school. And I had never done that. So they come take care of your dad. Hell, he was so handsome. He didn't look like it. And he, and I remember my, my, my attitude changed and my priorities changed when I saw that there was more to life and stuff. That was after my first year of law school. I was mm -hmm. like, well, my mom thereafter had had a number of falls and she became incapacitated um, and became an epileptic and I had to help her. She was so sad because she was a go-getter. She was a country woman. Oh, but she would always tell me, Beryl, look up the sky of us. Always look up. She was a woman with a dream, and she would put those dreams in our hearts. Where we all went to school. And she was a prosperous salesperson during the time when they had Negro insurance companies. Okay. And she would always say, Beryl, look up. And with that was a sense of adventure. Now, let's fast forward. I took care of my mom. Um, I would go back and forth and my heart would break because I was like praying and she wouldn't get well and she was so sad. And the last words to me, because I was the youngest daughter, my other sisters were much older. My mother had children late in life, just like I did. Mm -hmm. And my sister too. Uh, my brother and I, she were born at 37 and 39, so it's not uncommon to have children um, later in life as a woman. And she says, Beryl, Go live your life. Go live. Those are her parting words to me. Oh, wow. And that, isn't that something? Mm hmm I was like, Mom, I'll never forget. She was in the bed. Mom, yep, I can see her now. She said, I've lived my life. Now go live. Go live yours. So what, there was a sense of adventure. And I always remember looking at service. So now we fast forward. I've done all these things where I, as a single woman, I had a very active life and a very full life. I believe God for a husband, but I kept moving. I went all around the world, little girl from Leesburg, Florida, and, <laughs> no, one to, and no one to help me. Mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. We would laugh. At that point, that was when they fed you good on the planes. Mm -hmm. I had just enough money to get to the country I was going. I am not kidding. And to wait, and, ex and at that point, some of the countries required exit fees. You had to have $50, $25 to leave the country. And I'm here I am, single. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in private practice. I've got, I've got these big dreams. I've prayed and I'm going to go and do these great things. And I mean, I have just enough money to get that plane ticket, get those transfers, and enough money to get back home. That is it. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is way before the days of cell phones, okay? Mm -hmm. No cell phones in the mountains and the desert, all right? And you couldn't contact anyone. We would have to go to public places and stand in line and get a car. I didn't even have the money for that. But I went there with a sense of adventure to doing good things and serving. And so I get married, 75 and 35. And now life changes. I have a bonus child that I'm now raising. And of course, I got pregnant immediately. I was not pregnant. When I got married, but I got pregnant fast. I was old, okay? <laughs> <laughs> My first child at 36. And all that came with having children happened very rapidly, and my life changed. And so you get into now, after you've taken care of your parents, you're now taking care of your children. And then my oldest sister, then she was sick, and I took care of her. And I worked the whole time. I worked mm -hmm. all the time. I was an exhausted woman. And then I saw my husband, who was not on the road as much. When I asked him to get off the road, and he made some other taking some transitions from being with the Commodores, um, I had so many little children. You all would laugh when that man would travel out of town. I had all these babies crying, and I had been working. I would literally, until that plane descended, drive in a circle. And if that plane was late, I would keep driving. I couldn't wait to see the whites of his eyeballs 
please help me. <laughs> I am not kidding. I'll just drive around in a circle. <laughs> so I took motherhood very seriously. I was so glad to have children. And I love them so much. And they say, you had so many. I did. I like little children. And I work. And so there were many sacrifices. As we went that journey. And I wrote the book to encourage women to, although we're professionals, we have a lot of speeches on, mm-hmm. on being the best professional you can be. Be, mm-hmm. you know, coding. Get that. Do this, do that. But no one really encourages us to be the best moms you can be. And I don't mean just buying stuff. Mm-hmm. And I would hear the young ladies buying stuff. And because I knew stuff wasn't as important because I had been on the mission field. And I saw what it is when people were washing in the rivers. And when we as missionaries, they would swing the neck of the chicken and cook it for you right then. And such gratitude or um, to go in the barrios where even the dirt floors and um, even the, the stove that they cooked from was made of clay. And I understood that life was more than that. And so I took my children, I took my job so seriously to pour all in me. I didn't have anybody to help. I had a couple of people, but it didn't work. Because I believe that a mother, those children should have the values of their mother. And certain things cannot be delegated. Mm-hmm. We can abrogate and I loved those little, those little children. They were like kittens. Now, I was one of those people who let them uh, pitch tips in the living room, do flips off the good soap. <laughs> <laughs> I was one of those who would get ready for church and somebody would go outside and start playing and get dirty. Girl, I would just sit down like, oh, we all not going. We're just going to be pretty right here. We have church in the den. <laughs> I was mean, like, I give up, you know, all of that. And so you get through the phases and the kids get older and you poured into them integrity, strength, and character, all the things that I felt that were important. Um, faith in God, um, being the best. Um, I would take them also on missions trips. I would make my children take their Christmas money. I would have them take their Christmas money and to give. When you take them on a missions trip, their view of life changes. I took them all to Honduras. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we go on and now they're older and things are better financially and, and we're moving. And you say, what next? And now I'm amongst, I didn't travel with my husband before. He didn't travel very, more, very much. And now I, I'm looking at my husband. I've always been a defense attorney. As a little girl, I, I always wanted to be a defense attorney. And if I'm not, if I'm digressing, the trees bring me back in, okay? I have okay. Interviewed- <laughs> bring me in girl bring me in okay okay um so all of this inspired you to write the next chapter correct that's exactly okay. right so when i've taken you through this journey because my life has been in chapters and I'm just mm-hmm. chapters of life so now that the children are older what is the next chapter and i'm now almost 60 what are the new goals now that we no longer are caring for people like we were mm-hmm. right. now that we no longer doing homework projects we don't have to be a part of what is next what does that look like for me and that is what inspired it as i was on an airplane okay <laughs> okay so how did you come up with the name for the book did you just figure okay i'm entering in the next chapter of my life that's the that's, that's going to be the name of the book that's pretty much so. I was st- I, I was talking to my um, um my um, publisher, and that's basically what it was. Oh, okay. Was saying, well, well, what's next? What is the next chapter? What does that look like? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. That's hey, that's hey. It was catchy. Next chapter. <laughs> yeah, and to encourage people, to, uh, well, how are you going to design the next chapter of your life? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, what are you going to do? Are you going to be like everybody else and sit on the side and talk about others? Are, are you going to pursue um, next levels in your life? How are you going to design it? Because that pen is in your hand. But absolutely. 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 So what is the message that you want readers to gain from the next chapter? If, if it's one message that they can take away from the next chapter, what is it? It is to encourage women and men to recognize that there is, is never too late to write a new chapter in your life. Mm-hmm. 
it doesn't matter what it is, whether you want to pursue a new goal or children, or start a business, it doesn't, take a, uh, doesn't matter how long it takes, as long as you have breath in that, your body, that means you still have an opportunity available to you. That means that we are still positioned to do whatever it is that we dream of doing. Okay. But that also comes from taking care of yourself, mind, body, and soul. Mm-hmm. Much of my book is about self-care. Mm-hmm. What about me? Mm-hmm. You're not forgotten. Have you taken care of yourself? It's the only temple we've got. Have you taken care of your mind? Have you taken care of your body in order to move forward to that next chapter? And not to feel guilty. Mm -hmm. Not to feel guilty when you choose self-care. Not to feel guilty when you decide to come to the front of the bus. Mm -hmm. It's my time now. I've Mm -hmm. served you well, but it's my time now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we as mothers, and I'm guilty of that myself, we as mothers, sometimes we, you know, we, we, we're so used to putting everybody first, that sometimes we put us on the back burner. So yeah, totally get that. That's exactly right. Um, the back burner. And then we um, get older and we can live in shoulda, coulda, and woulda. You know, mm-hmm. I did my first half marathon at 60. Oh, wow. And I trained. And I had my vision board. I used to jog when I was younger, and then I had gained a bunch of weight, and then I wanted to lose it. But I did that. My 16-year-old niece got me into it, and I trained. We were going to do this half marathon in Jacksonville together. I get there. I trained. You know, I only had two goals. I'll make you laugh. I had two goals. Guess what they were? They were to not to come in last. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Not to come in last. No, I was not going to come in last. And And secondly, to beat her. I was going to beat that 16-year-old. And I would run um, um, uh, and increase my speeds because I wanted to beat her. And that was my 60-year-old goal. And then I did it. I'll be 63 next month. Um, Doing things we hadn't done before as a way of keeping um, the next chapter in our minds. What's the next thing we're going to come up? Which are other okay. solid things that I do too. More. Okay. Okay. Very good. Will there be more books from you? Yes, ma'am. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> I'm going to do something about um, as it relates to relationships um, mm-hmm. from, my, um, from my husband and I. I'm always asked the question, how can you tell when it's real? Mm-hmm. How can you and your husband work together? Because we work together and travel together um, now that he's gotten back on the road. I was even one of his seven lawyers in some major litigation. How do you stay in love with each other? How do you become, I mean, you can tell we are friends. We are business partners. How do you get over the humps and the bumps? I'm always asked that about how to stay married. People are always fascinated in asking this question. So rolling that in, I am going to write a relationship Um book what does it take what's that language um that in my law in my law practice domestic violence i mean my, a domestic relations one of the areas i listen to the young women and i find that they are cute you're beautiful you got your weave on you got your natural you got your bodies right or unright you're confident but their language is too strong i used to represent men and, I'm mm-hmm. like, and so I would listen to the young women on the other side in their conversations. They snap it up, hook their neck, and told him something. <laughs> and I'm like, baby, you're going to lose your man. <laughs> it's your mouth. <laughs> your mouth. No one taught you how to speak the love language. What mm-hmm. does a man like to hear? Okay. Okay. All righty. That sounds good. Sounds really good. Is that getting you interested, girl? <laughs> <laughs> Old fashioned. My mother always says I have an old soul. So, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I believe in being courted. <laughs> hey, that's right. That's why it works. Yes, yes, yes. Um, where can readers get your uh, current book, Next Chapter? They can um, go to Barnes and Nobles. It will eventually be on Amazon. They can also um, go to my website and order it, and I can send it to them. My website is um, www.beryllmcclary.com. Of course, Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, and they can find me on social media. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. So, 
Who inspires you and why? Name two people. Name two people, easy. Oh, another course, Dorothy Lee Thompson, and recently a vibrant young woman by the name of Lisa Nichols. Okay, okay. Why do um, why do they um, these two particular women inspire you? Um, basically, they both have this in common: coming from humble beginnings and the ability to see through problems and achieve in spite of. Now, Lisa um, Nichols is a very interesting woman, a very black woman um, speaker, but she has gone to put her um, business, um, it, it really has, she has an IPO or a speaking um, um, business. She's the first mm-hmm. black woman, and I listened to her story, uh, very inspiring, and in how she acquired the necessary skills to move forward and become that multimillionaire while being able to. Um, maintained her faith in God um, and um, developed necessary skills to move forward, uh, much like that of Tyler Perry. And I like the fact that she seems to be very grounded in that. And um, as well as my mother, who would always tell you to never give up no matter what it is. She wasn't, she wasn't accepting an excuse and was so calm during emergencies or what we thought was something that was so detrimental that would just destroy you. And I, I go back to that and I was sharing that with my husband. I, I said, uh, mother would look at all of this. And I remember when I was going through as a young lawyer, you know, I didn't expect very embarrassing and heartbreaking that she was in the hospital then about a month before her demise. Mm-hmm. And I came into the hospital and she was, um, had been intubated and she pulled it out. She was a country girl. Oh, wow. Several times. And so I came in there. I was about to whine. Mom. And she stopped me. And you know what she said? She said, there will be a woman. And I knew what that meant. Okay. And I went to that. That is, go through it. Whatever life throws at you, go through it. Okay. 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 Very good. So what advice can you give young people today um, when it comes to their dreams and goals and um, just living in this particular time and age that we're in? In this time and age, my advice, let's tell my sons, is to be prepared in those areas and not just to be a dreamer, but be a doer. Mm -hmm. I advise my son, I said, first of all, I, I have um, out of the six, I have three sons and three girls. Mm-hmm. My sons are ages 26, 25, and 24. Okay. Um, having attended Boston College, Howard University, Berkeley College of Music, one is an aspiring um, musician and performer. Um, so what do I tell them? I always tell them, you've got to pray. It's not going to be separated. You must have faith that God will bring you through. The second of all, you must have integrity where you can't be bought. Mm -hmm. Next, with your honesty, you must have the ability to listen and to learn. I said, you must keep a journal. Write your goals down. Write them down in your phone and review those goals. Without a plan, you plan to fail. I said, learn that. I write it down and go back through them at the beginning of each year. Um, Some do it, some don't. I have goals. I will learn from people who have more than I do. So I don't need a conversation of those who have what I have. I need to learn to find out how those get what they got. Absolutely. I always encourage learning and learning more and they see that in me. Mm-hmm. Um, and to serve. I actually, so to go on, I actually listen to the young people. I have them on my Facebook live show, the next chapter, where I've had the young people to tell me what their views were about the Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And um, they were very articulate. I had the guys on when they were um, protesting there in New York. I did have some young, educated, first-generation Haitians 
um, to give me their perspective of Black Lives Matter since their parents were part of the movement and they weren't either, but, and they would have been the benefactors of the sacrifices of the Blacks in the 60s and the 70s. What was their point of view? So what would I tell them? It is good to have speeches. It is good to pursue money. That's great because it takes it to move. But there comes a time in life you must stand for something. And it has to be more than talk. Absolutely. If you don't get out and vote, and I don't find you all getting out to vote because I volunteer. I volunteer. I'm one of those super voters. Mm -hmm. All of this talk means nothing. You're right back. Um, where everybody else is. Talk is easy. Mm -hmm. Criticize. I said, and I say, I, I, I'm listening and I hear the young people on some of the young, um, forgive me, hip hop YouTube shows criticizing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it's obvious they had paid the price. They don't know the history. The one thing about going to school, you have to know the history mm -hmm. to understand what you're saying. I'm like, why are you saying that? And I encourage them, don't be a criticizer. Don't stand on the sidelines because when you do, you are complicit as well. You must do things that will effectuate change, which requires action. And I'm going to ask, as I ask my boys, what are the actions that you're taking to make this change? Don't just tell me you've spoken good words. You've discussed it among yourselves. You've dodged a bullet. And you have not taken any action politically to effectuate the change. So I tell them, let your walks be louder than your talk and your criticisms and your evaluations. Let there be action taken to effectuate the change that you desire to see come about. Okay. Okay. Now, 2020 has been a very interesting year, um, somewhat challenging. Um, how have you coped with um, COVID, um, with every with quarant, with, you know, with everyone being remotely um, working? Um, actually, at first I kind of enjoyed it. I was a little upset at first. Okay, <laughs> I was middle, uh, well, because I was in the middle of a hearing. I'm a trial lawyer, and mm -hmm. we, were, uh, we had just sued a, a doctor, his wife. We represented the wife. And the day that they shut things down, oh, well, it was continued with a case. They said, well, we got some hearings. We might not. And we were in the middle about to start attorney's fees. And we really wanted to be paid. We put a lot of money in this case. <laughs> so our case was canceled because of COVID. And we hadn't gotten into the courtroom yet. We were like, ah, where are our attorney's fees? You know, attorney's fees here. Um, so that was. So, but on a lighter note, after we reevaluated, I had been on the road with my husband for so long, for two and a half years or three years, and I was really tired. And also being a trial lawyer and litigation, and I, even though we weren't prepared for, I welcomed the um, rest mm -hmm. to reevaluate. Mm -hmm. it was, it, it, you knew that COVID nineteen was bigger than us, bigger than the U.S., because it hit the yes. whole world. Yes. I would, I would tell my children and my husband, I said, it is a time to hear what the Lord is saying, and for those who don't believe in God, the universe, whatever you mm -hmm. call it. Because what else has shut down the entire world? What is the message beyond the inconvenience of economics and mass? And that yes. was what I said, was to find out what is the bigger message, Lord? Mm -hmm. What is it that you would have me to see and understand that you would call the whole world to stop? Mm -hmm. And for me, it was a time of reflection and listening and to see life just slow down. Absolutely. 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 So how can our listeners learn more about you and where can they follow you on social media? Well, they can learn more about me as of today. <laughs> um, with um, If they go to my Facebook page, and they'll see a few things about me there and videos that we've done. I introduce myself and introduce chapters of my book as well as other relevant topics 
but of um, current events. I've I brought in speakers, so that's going to be on Facebook.com, Beryl McCleary. I, they can always contact me at info at BerylMcCleary.com. Love to hear from them. Love to answer your questions. Of course, Facebook.com, Beryl McCleary. And, um, and if they see that number of 888-640-2999, feel free to call and have a message. I love to chat and find out more about what's happening and how I can address what issues that might be on your mind. And maybe, maybe I can mentor, maybe I can bring a light to those places that I've had to walk through and, and succeeded at walking through. Okay, that's beautiful. That You know, I love that. You, you're reaching back, teaching mentoring that's what we supposed to do and um not a lot of times you hear that from um from authors or even those who are you know in in your position you know um you have a lot of wisdom a lot of golden nuggets that you could um pass on to many generations um thank you for that thank you for that um in closing of the show, I just want to say congratulations on the next chapter. Look forward to the relationship book. Um, I'm gonna have to add this one to my um, to my library. <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna add to your library? The next chapter. See what the, what your next chapter is gonna be. You're so young. Uh, relationships. I, I really have been considering this relationships. If I'm hearing and and more people are stopping my husband and I asking questions. Yeah. Well, you know what? You have a demand. There it is, right there. There it is. Yeah, there's a demand. So I'm. I said, "Time is us to analyze. Mm-hmm. Why, uh, why do we still like each other?" <laughs> <laughs> well, that is good. That is really good, especially black love. You know, right. black love is beautiful. You know, that's, um, right. that's absolutely right. Uh, you, you know, and, and and it's not phony. We're it's authentic, as you you know, as you'll see him on my. You can go and see him, I guess, on YouTube. Okay, and Carol McClary, um, my um, my virtual book signing, as he sings to me, "Lady," and I think one of the others when the, when the, when um, the, the the gentleman. Um, Mr. Floyd, I, I was crying when I saw him suffer as a criminal defense attorney. I was the first criminal defense. Mm-hmm. I could hardly take it because I have sons and they think of what had happened to that man and what had happened for me is I remember the young man telling me those stories. Mm-hmm. And see my husband comfort us and as we move as one, it is always my desire. But for those who want to marry, that you should and to find it and to, and to get not find a good man. Mm-hmm. For those men who don't know how to be a good man, I can perhaps point you in the way that um, you can, some things to bring to your attention. And for those who are in relationships, assuming that there's no verbal and physical abuse, uh, how do we make this work? Because I do a lot of time sharing. Mm-hmm. I, know I came from a mother and a father. And I hear my children saying, oh, my friends, they're, they're, you know, every other weekend, and they're like, we don't quite get that, but okay. And it's a, it seems like we were anomaly that they had the same mother and father, same children all living in this household. And for the young women, how to love your children and make them um, and, and love yourself mm-hmm. in the midst of a world that would say, do this and do that. Uh, understanding that there's a season for everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being on the podcast on Sisters Place podcast today. Um, I truly enjoyed your conversation and everyone make sure you go and pick up the next chapter available on Barnes and Noble, Amazon, and make sure you visit our website. I will definitely drop some information on our Sisters Place page um, on Facebook um, so that you can pick up a copy of her book. Congratulations, and thank Thank you again. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Be sure to subscribe to Latrice's YouTube channel, Sister's Place, and follow her on all social media.